Uh, there are a lot of panels at this conference that didn't exist when we started it back in 2012. I, off the top of my head, whistleblowers, cybersecurity, crypto, and now we have AI, which we'll see how it develops. But this panel is going to be on the impact of AI on securities enforcement, regulation, compliance, and practice. And we have a really terrific group here. Um, let me start by introducing Greg Baker, who's a partner at Patterson Belknap in New York, and he is a former senior counsel with the Enforcement Division and a member of the Asset Management Unit. Our moderator today is Bridget Moore. Uh, Bridget is a partner at Baker Botts in Washington, D.C., and co-chair of the lit litigation department firm-wide, and also a former attorney in the SEC's Division of Enforcement. To her left is James Walker. James is a partner at Perkins Coie based in New York. At Perkins Coie, James is the firm-wide co-lead of the FinTech Compliance and Enforcement Practice. Uh, next down in the green is Carolyn Welshans. She's Associate Director in the uh, SEC's Division of Enforcement. She's served for over 16 years at the SEC in a, a range of positions, uh, including as a member of the Market Abuse Unit. And finally, uh, to the far end is Jeremiah Williams. He is a partner at Ropes and Gray in Washington, D.C., uh, a former senior counsel in the Enforcement Division and a member of the Asset Management Unit. So let me turn it over to you, Bridget. Great, thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, so I was excited to be able to participate in this panel because, you know, AI is kind of such a, a hot topic. And before we kind of dig in, we, we thought that it might be good to level set because I think we hear the term AI used frequently um, and it can encompass so many different things. So before we kind of dive into the regulatory aspects of it, we wanted, just wanted to, to, to take a minute to do that. So um, Jeremiah, um, do you want to kick us off and just kind of talk us through the, the kind of the, the um, neuro networks versus the more <laughs> traditional AI? Yeah, um, so it is confusing and there's a lot of technical terms. So just to keep it very simple, uh, if you think about a traditional computer program that's not AI, um, that program has rules and instructions that are designed to perform a task. By contrast, an AI algorithm is not programmed to perform a task, it is programmed to learn how to perform a task. That really, at a very high level, is the key distinction. And the AI system is learning to perform that task without you know, specific instructions. It's by inferring it. Um, and so that, that, that's the key di uh, difference with AI. And when people say AI, a lot of times what they're really talking about, the most common form is really machine learning. Uh, machine learning is processing, um, oftentimes, vast amounts of data. Um, and by processing, analyzing this data, it is able to make predictions or identify patterns. And again, it's able to do that without the specific instruction set that you'd have in a traditional computer program. Uh, so we talk about machine learning. There's many examples of that. We'll talk about some of those, you know, in a bit. Um, and then, you know, there's been a lot of talk about chat GPT, obviously. Uh, and that is a specific um, type of machine learning uh, that involves neural networks. And really it's called neural networks because it's designed to really replicate the thinking that goes on with the brain as far as neurons there. So that is AI 101, AI for dummies. Great. And James, I um, just wanted to get your, your thoughts on both kind of the, the, the broad term AI and also what you consider in your practice as the biggest concerns um, for regulators um, with the use of AI. So uh, the, the one, one key thing to understand about AI is that it is a broad range of types of programs and types of approaches to artificial intelligence. Um, you know, Jeremiah described uh, the, the, sort of the distinction between you know, predictive data and analytics, um, which is largely what we're talking about in the rulemaking um, is talking about. But then you have chat GPT and neural networks that are generating content and generating, you know, college 
uh, students' papers, probably, um, and, and, and things like that that are a little bit frightening. Um, and and that's, that's, a, that's not so much involved yet, although the way the technology works, you'll start to see it creep in uh, a little bit, um, which is why it's a good idea to start some rulemaking to think about AI generally. The, 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 the important thing here is that it's very much algorithm-driven, um, data-driven, um, in order to think about understanding it, you need to think about what are the re what are the sources of data, um, what are the algorithms involved, how are they working, how can I understand what what results I'm getting through this product, and while we as lawyers sort of went through this as litigators um, in using you know predictive, predictive data in discovery and you know tar and those sorts of things, and got comfortable with it some years ago, sort of. Um, it, it, you know, it gets a little more complicated when we start to apply this into other areas. Um. Great, thanks. Uh, so kind of moving on to how AI is, is being utilized, and we'll talk about, you know, with, with respect to, um, to the financial industry and then, and then issuers that are not in the financial industry. Um, but kind of starting with the financial financial industry, um, Greg, what are you seeing in terms of how AI is being utilized, with, with the caveat that your answer today could be different tomorrow as AI develops? <laughs> yeah, in some ways it's easier to think about how is it not being used. I mean, if, if you can imagine it, I think people out there are, are contemplating a way to apply AI. Um, as James and Jeremiah just mentioned, AI is able to process large quantities of data and analyze it in an efficient, fast manner. Um, so just for purposes of, of this presentation, a few key areas. One is portfolio management. Uh, firms are using AI to uh, analyze and detect patterns in trading. Um, uh, we've seen algorithmic trading. Algorithmic trading has been used for quite some time now. That's a form of AI. Um, but the software is only getting more sophisticated as we talked about generative AI and the neural networks. Um, another key area, I would say, is compliance and reg tech. So reg tech is the ability for firms to quickly adapt to developing uh, rules and regulations that are issued by the SEC as well as other financial regulators um, and implement those into their systems to make sure that they're compliant. Uh, on the compliance side, a uh, simple example, uh, monitoring employee communications. Uh, you have the data pool. AI is able to uh, process and analyze that data in a very efficient manner and detect uh, potential compliance issues uh, quick, more quickly than, than humans can. Um, and the last point I'll mention is, is cybersecurity. Uh, obviously, firms are, have an obligation to protect uh, their systems and customer information. Um, and the, the issue with cybersecurity is that it's an evolving threat. Uh, people are constantly, criminals are constantly thinking of ways to access databases and systems. AI has a real potential to thwart attacks um, and, uh, and, and help uh, firms protect against intrusions into their systems. Great. Thanks. Um, and moving on to the, the regulatory aspects of it, um, Carolyn, how do you see um, the SEC using AI in terms of how it you know, looks at the markets or in enforcement? Um, thanks, Bridget, and it's a, a really timely question. Um, and before I get to it, of course, I have to give uh, the standard disclaimer uh, that I am here today in my capacity as an associate director in the Division of Enforcement, and the views I express today are my own and not necessarily those of the commission, the commissioners, or the commission staff. Um, so when it comes to the SEC, um, you know, obviously, of course, I'm not going to give away our secrets here today, um, so I think won't surprise anybody. I'm going to talk at a high level. I know. I'm sorry. Um, but um, I think what I can say is, you know, first of all, a shout out to the SEC staff. They are just incredible and have been incredible and will continue to be incredible in their use of uh, sophisticated data analytics, including building homegrown tools uh, to conduct analysis. Um, uh, using lots of disparate data sources 
and uh, coming through voluminous data. That's not going to change. Um, and our interest in being on the cutting edge when the industry is on the cutting edge um, is not going to change. So um, I foresee us having a real interest in this space. Uh, we've spent um, a lot of resources in the Division of Enforcement to hire, including in the last year, a number of data scientists. Um, we have data analysts um, and other kinds of specialists, as do other divisions and offices at the SEC, in particular um, our Division of Economic and Risk Analysis, or DIRA, Trading and Markets and Exams. Um, we collaborate with them all the time, um, as well as FinHub, um, on issues of technology and emerging and advanced uh, techniques. In addition to um, what may be our use um, of increased uh, technology, we're also interested in monitoring the use of AI by those that we regulate. Um, we are interested in how they are using AI um, in a way that could impact the market or investors. Um, again, this is not something uh, new or unfamiliar to us. Uh, we've brought in the past a number of cases based on um, regulated entities' use of technology. Uh, for example, cases involving um, broker-dealers who had algorithms uh, that went out of control, um, or broker-dealers who did not handle orders um, with their algorithms in the ways that they had disclosed, um, or firms that did not have uh, sufficient controls in place to prevent the placement of erroneous orders resulting in many flash crashes. So those are just a few examples, I think, of um, how we've already been in this advanced technology space and are looking forward uh, to seeing um, where it might go next. Uh, similar to you know, what we've already heard on the panel, we're also interested in monitoring for how our companies, um, or uh, specific, specifically talking here about regulated entities, because I know we're going to talk about uh, public companies in a moment, how are they handling <coughs> Uh, risks posed to them by potentially the use of AI by others. Um, so depending on a, a, a regulated entity's business model or customer base, um, even if they themselves are not using AI, um, they may face particular risks um, by others um, who could be using it against them, um, posing threats to them or, or their customers. So that's, I think, another place uh, that we'll be monitoring. Great. Thank you. Um, and moving on to, to the public companies, um, non-regulated, um, and kind of thinking about what type of enforcement matters could be out there, how we can help our clients prepare um, in this area. Um, Jeremiah, what, what do you, what's your take on this topic in terms of these of, of the issuers and, and um, you know what they can do to prepare? Um, to make sure that they are disclosing the proper things or they are um, set up well from a regulatory perspective? Yeah, so, I mean, this is really kind of uh, related to what Carolyn said, right? So um, I think, you know, one obvious area is just, you know, with disclosure, obviously, right? So, um, you know, are, is, is, is management disclosing um, how they're affected by AI, what the risks are posed by AI, um, that's something that I think um, will be scrutinized very closely, and that's something that certainly could be the subject of future enforcement actions. Um, a lot of this comes down to disclosure. That's been kind of a common thing we've talked about. Um, also, you know, when you think about um, issuers as opposed to regulated entities, you think about regulated entities as far as like compliance and this, you know, uh, specific compliance requirements that regulated entities have. But um, public companies also do their own compliance, right? They um, they they look for you know um, anti-corruption, FCPA issues, and things like that. And you know they they also have uh, ways in which they monitor employees and so forth. And and AI could be used for that, and that's something that could also um, be relevant. Yeah, and I'll just add to that. Um, you know, I, I completely agree with what Jeremiah said. Um, we are first and foremost a disclosure agency. So if a company has material risks or something about their use of AI um, uh, is material, whether it's because of what their business model is or their products or their customers, um, you know, I think you could expect the SEC to be paying attention to what are they disclosing or not disclosing as a result 
but in addition um, to disclosure, public companies could have other obligations related to AI. Um, again, depending on the particular facts and circumstances of that company, um, you could have situations where internal accounting controls or disclosure controls are implicated um, by AI or the risks posed to the company by AI. Yeah. And so I know we all kind of follow what the SEC is doing on cyber. Um, in my mind, at least, there's a distinction. We're talking about disclosures and, uh, between, you know, there is overlap, certainly, but with cyber and AI. Can you, is, do you agree with that or? Um, I mean, I, I, I agree there's overlap there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that um, cyber, because that's a place where we have brought some cyber disclosure cases, um, for example, it is a good place to look for as an analogy that's somewhat close, especially when you're talking about issuers. You know, I was drawing the analogy with regulated entities when you're talking about algorithms and use of technology for order placement, for example. When it comes to, to public um, companies, to issuers, um, I think cybersecurity can be a close analogy as well as um, you know, other uh, aspects that, that go to materiality, go to internal controls. I think the overlap there that I was bringing up is the fact that like cybersecurity, um, I think it's something that, that companies are gonna have to deal with mm -hmm. because there could be risks posed to companies um, and again, those risks could be very particularized um, based on a company's business model or its systems or its security or something like that from AI being used by others. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thanks. Um, so kind of moving on to every, the getting our arms kind of around AI and the rules of the road, um, always kind of helpful to, to, to kind of look to see what the regulators are, are looking at and, and how they might... Um, put some um, rules, regulations, and James, you had you had kind of mentioned that earlier. Um, so, what do you what do you expect to see in terms of rules and regulations in this area? So, let me just talk about what's what's happened so far. Um, so, back in April, uh, the SEC Investor Advisory Committee uh, issued a letter uh, requesting that the SEC's Division of Examinations draft best practices. Um, for the use of AI by advisors and, and broker-dealers. Um, sort of focusing on uh, sort of a reboot or, re or looking back to the 2017 uh, guidance that was issued for robo-advisors, focusing on three sort of core areas, essentially disclosures, um, the obligation to get information from clients, and the adoption of uh, effective compliance procedures. So that's one thing. Um, more recently, in July, the um, SEC issued a proposed new rule that would apply to broker-dealers and registered investment advisors um, and requires them to take steps to address potential conflicts that are created by the use of AI tools um, in, at, by broker-dealers and investment advisors, focused on predictive data analytics, or PDA. Um, the idea is that the PDA programs can uh, create conflicts where you could have uh, the investment advisor or broker dealer uh, prioritize their, their interests prioritize over clients. Um, how, is that, how does that arise? Well, it sort of goes to a lot of what we're talking about here. Um, there's this notion of black box predictive an analytics, uh, data analytics, um, meaning you don't really know how it works. Um, if we were to ask anyone on this panel, well, how do these programs work? We'd all say, you know, ask Jeremiah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and hope he comes up with something. <laughs> but, you know, let's face it, we just don't. Um, even if we're looking at a particular program, we get a certain level of understanding, but digging in deep to really understand how the program works, um, how, what the algorithm uh, sort of prioritizes and doesn't prioritize, it weights things, different factors, um, what are the data that, what's the data that it looks at? All of that um, can lead to really different results. And so the rule is saying, if you know you're going to be using um, these tools, and it's foreseeable that you're using these tools in connection with investor communications, um, with uh, use exercise of discretion, or solicitation of investors, then you need to comply with this rule, and there are things that you need to do. You need to test the program before you implement it, and you need to periodically retest. 
Um, you need to understand the results and, and come to a conclusion as to whether or not um, it's creating conflicts along the lines that I described. Uh, you need to eliminate or neutralize the AI-generated conflict. You need to have policies and procedures in place to ensure compliance. You need to keep written books and records. Um, and that's essentially, the, those are the main factors that, that are covered by this proposed rule. Now, if you think about that and step back for a second, there's some really notable challenges. The first one is, what is this AI that the, that the company is using? What do they understand about it? Um, how do they analyze um, whether or not this, this bias is, is happening? Um, and then, more than that, how do you prove uh, the negative, essentially, that there isn't uh, some sort of conflict that's created by the way this program is generated? Because all this stuff is incredibly complicated. So some real challenges um, highlighting you can't just sort of buy the program and, and, and leave it at that. You, there are things that more, there's more that you need to do. Also has implications for any of the software providers who obviously need to also step up um, and be able to assist here. The last thing I'll mention is that there was, there's a recent sweep um, issued by the SEC or SEC examiners of private funds to really dig into what are, how are private funds using these AI tools. Um, there's a pretty fairly comprehensive request of uh, information about the models and techniques, the uh, policies and procedures in place, any errors that are generated, any reporting of errors, any validation of the, the programs, regulatory, ethical, legal issues that, 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 that were identified, um, you know, security, um, what kind of marketing is done, what kind of disclosure is done about the use of these programs, what media is used to advertise the use of the programs, and also really getting digging deep into supervision of the use of AI programs. Um, who's involved at the company? I, like literally identify who's involved. Um, what board members are involved? Identify who's involved. How often do they meet? Um, so really trying to say, okay, look, private fund industry, we need to understand what you're doing um, so that we can sort of educate ourselves and educate you and figure out what's the appropriate approach here. Great, thank you. Um, so coming back to you, Greg, um, and you started to, to discuss this a little bit, but in terms of um, clients um, and in regulated industries, but you know also issuers to uh, the non-regulated entities, um, who are using AI, um, how, what, what types of, of, of things can we do as lawyers to help them prepare for the SEC to come knocking and, um, but, and just good, you know, good compliance measures and things like that? The rules don't change. Uh, the rules do not become more permissive because you're using AI, even though it has a potential to make your job more efficient, even though it has a potential uh, to produce better outcomes for your clients. Uh, the rules don't change. And what I often do with, with clients uh, who use AI is engage in a, a thought experiment with them. What would you do if XYZ happens and the SEC shows up and starts asking questions? The first question I have for them is, how well do you really understand the system? Um, we've talked on this panel about the different forms of AI. AI in some form has been around for quite some time, whether it's predictive coding for document review, algorithmic trading. But the tipping point really seems to be, and why I think we all have started talking a lot about it this year, is the adaptation of neural networks. The next evolution, where computers are actually able to train themselves and teach themselves. If you hear some of the leading scientists, people who actually developed these neural networks, they have concerns about where it's going and our ability to really comprehend what the limits are of the neural networks uh, and the ability to control it in the long term. So if you're using AI, if you're a client, the first thing you have to ask yourself is, how well do I understand it? If you have concerns about your ability to control it or your comprehension, it's probably a big risk factor or a big red flag. That means maybe you should take a step back and, and reconsider. Um, the second thing is, how frequently are you, t are you testing your systems? First of all, are you testing your systems? Uh, and how frequently are you doing so? Um, the thing about AI and neural networks and generative AI, it, it's an evolving system. Technology is increasing every year, every day, really. Uh, you have to engage in frequent testing to make sure that the systems 
are working properly. Policies and procedures, uh, a core issue for any regulated entity, particularly in the investment advisor space or broker dealer space, how frequently are you reviewing your policies and procedures? What policies and procedures do you have uh, that govern AI? And I think a critical thing that, that a lot of clients and firms don't really think about is who's ultimately taking responsibility for this? Um, CCOs aren't necessarily software engineers. They don't necessarily understand the product. They can't, you can't just delegate pure responsibility to CCOs or GCs, GCs and say, hey, it's your problem. You really have to have software engineers uh, and people who are responsible for the systems as part of the compliance process who can test and make sure that the policies and procedures are being updated and that they're, they're kept in the process of uh, testing the systems. Um, and and the, the final thing I'll say on this point is uh, it, it's, it's a risk point. What do you do if something goes wrong? What do you do if trading goes haywire or if there's a cybersecurity incident? Uh, what protocols do you have in place? Do you have a backup system in the event that you're, to the extent that you're relying on AI, in the event that that system goes down? You have to think through all of these things. It's a risk management exercise um, that everyone should be doing uh, in this space, and that's how I advise folks. Right. Can I pick up on, on that a little bit? One of the key issues here is how do you identify that something's gone wrong? Um, if you have a, a predictive program that is taking in data uh, over a period of time on particular trading patterns or um, you know, well-favored you know, investments and that sort of thing, you realize that for the program to work well, it has to not get stuck with the data that it has. I mean, in other words, you don't want to just repeat what's always been the case. You have to make sure that there are inputs that will vary the results over time based on a huge range of factors. Um, and, that's, and it's that sort of thing where you have repetition of what already exists that create, frankly can create bias. Um, you know, if there's a factor in there, uh, in this algorithm, that, you know, somehow favors the re revenue generated for the particular broker dealer or invest investment advisor, well, you know, the program in, just in the testing phase probably got rewarded in some way when it generated better returns. Well, that's exactly how you could end up with bias toward that, you know, the, the institution. Um, that isn't necessarily you, what, the way you want that to work. Um, so there are all sorts of little factors like that that go into what's a very complicated program where you can sort of imagine if you break it down to sort of simple um, simple data um, why, why this happens. So I, I, there's an example I, I use because it, it is simple um, that um, doesn't much have to do with AI but does have to do with uh, functioning of a, of, of a program. Um, the uh, electronic dispensers in, in the, the, the restrooms um, were tested on people with very pale hands. Um, and so what happens when people who had, say, darker skin um, started using them, they find themselves sort of waving their hands, frustrated, and believe me, this still happens. Um, and so they finally said, oh, wait, we didn't really think about that factor when we were getting this, these you know, automatic dispensers to work. So you have people like me, like waving their hands around like a crazy person, um, not understanding why, but just understanding that, understanding that that piece of data wasn't considered tells you a lot about what can go wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'd, I'd like to just follow up because I think James and, and, and Greg just made some really good points of um, thinking about what happens if something does go wrong. Um, you know, and first of all, I, I think AI has a lot of promise. Um, I'm not someone who is scared of technology. Um, one of the groups that I supervise at the SEC is a group of analysts and data scientists. Um, so I think there's a lot of promise in this technology. But if companies do choose to use it, um, they do need to be thinking about the risks. And with this particular technology, I, and I think this was one of the points you were just making, you may not be able to game all of that out. That's part of the point of this technology is that it, it evolves, so you may not be able to on day one or day 10 or day 300 um, be able to know exactly what the risks are and have spelled out all of them. But I think what's important is to have an incident response plan so that if something does go wrong, 
um, do people know who they're supposed to escalate it to within the company? Who are the decision makers, whether that comes to disclosure or controls or within the technology function, um, who need to be told? And do people understand how that's supposed to work? I think that's a really important part um, for companies to be thinking about, whether they're regulated entities or issuers. I mean, it's, it's, you, it almost sounds like a little bit of the approach with the cyber, cyber data breach, right? It's like things are going to go wrong. Something going wrong in and of itself is not necessarily um, an enforcement action or a violation, but being prepared for it, having proper policies and procedures, having an action plan, um, having adequate disclosure of the problem after it has happened. Uh, I think if, if, if uh, firms look at you know, the approach there and maybe apply some of those techniques here, it's, it's a similar sort of thinking as far as like, it's not if or when as far as some of these problems. So uh, a question for, for any, anybody on the panel. Um, you know, in terms of how a company responds, and um, you know who's in the room and who who's responsible for various things. I think we've seen um, boards evolve, right? As as um, we've seen issues come up, right? So boards, you have to have you know a, a um, somebody uh, you know who is steeped in, in auditing. Now you, we see a lot of boards with with cyber. Do you, do you all think that we'll start seeing boards with with somebody to the extent that you know it's it's a company. Um, that relies on it. That is that is kind of a quote unquote expert in AI. A absolutely. I mean, I, I find very interesting that the um, the sweep. One of the questions is precisely that: What's the board involvement? What are they doing? Who's involved? What pro what procedures are in place? How often do they meet? I remember. I can't remember now how long ago. Let's say seven, eight years. I can't. I don't remember when there were discussions about cyber and the fact that the board. Boards needed to be involved in understanding their cybersecurity. Um, and eventually that developed into really making sure that somebody took responsibility for that, that, the, that you, know, you had a, a committee on the board or somebody who was really thinking about, okay, are we really up to snuff in terms of our cybersecurity? I think a similar sort of um, thing will happen with AI. It's like, we're, you know, if we're using this, and particularly the more that we use it, um, there has to, the, the company has to take responsibility and it has to go all the way up. Um, Carolyn, what do you think about, do you think you know, that would be something favorably looked upon or something that would be expected in the right circumstances? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm an enforcement attorney, so my favorite phrase is depends on the facts and circumstances. Um, but, um, I, you know, I, I think that at the very least, um, if it is something that is central to the company in some way, I, I think I'd want to understand that, that, that at the very least uh, the, a, a board if they don't have the expertise in and of themselves, are, is there somebody they are consulting, relying upon, who is explaining um, to them so they can make the decisions that boards have to make? Um, you know, how are they getting that information, um, and um, have they uh, been getting that information? And so I think that you know, it, again, it's going to depend on the company, um, but. Is it a board that if it doesn't have it in and of itself, how are they how are they getting that expertise? Because otherwise, how can you make truly informed decisions? Got it. Great. You know, I think one other thing that comes into play at some point is what's the competitive picture? Mm -hmm. um, if there are AI tools that allow you to do this or that process faster, um, issuers, companies will want to have that in place to remain competitive. Um, certainly, you know, investment advisors, broker dealers want to have that in place to remain competitive. Um, there's a pressure to move in that direction and to take in the new technology. The problem, though, is that you need to not just take it in and not understand it. Um, double negative didn't really work, but anyway, you know what I mean. <laughs> um, so, um, but but you know, there, there's a sort of competitive pressure that could move uh, companies in a certain direction without before they're really quite ready. Um, to to take in that process. Mm -hmm. Just oh, picking up on just something that James said. I mean, we've talked about from the perspective of companies are adopting AI and what can go wrong. We really haven't talked about the flip side of that, which is companies that do not uh, adopt AI out of these concerns, but that also creates a different set of risks. That you're actually foregoing opportunities to be able to identify things and the competitive pressures that James talked about. So it's really it's risk on both sides. Um, 
one thing that came up, and, and Greg, I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts on this, is in terms of, in, in the regulated space, um, a company that uses AI as part of its, whether it's portfolio management or, or whatever, um, have you had experience or any, any thoughts on, you know, how much that entity um, needs to discuss with their, their client base kind of what they're using? I mean, how granular do they have to get to make the customer comfortable, right, with, with what they're doing? Yeah, I mean, it, there's always a balance between how much you actually have to disclose without disclosing the secret sauce of the right. <laughs> of the the trading algorithms or, or so forth. Um, but you have to disclose enough for the customers, clients, uh, to understand who they're investing with and how the systems work. Um, and I do think that's only going to get more challenging as you start dealing with more sophisticated AI uh, applications, uh, uh, neural networks, generative AI, and so forth. Um, just one, 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 I want to pick up on something we've discussed earlier. Just a lot of these issues with AI, I, I really do think revolve around the data set. We heard Chair Gensler earlier, for those of you who weren't here, he talked about the risk from 2027, 2032 being the hurting risk, that in the future there may, may be only a handful of AI applications. They're all going to rely on the same da data set. Uh, you might see a trading run in one direction because everyone's relying on the same set of data. Uh, firms, registered firms, may not be thinking about kind of this macro economic risk necessarily, but I do think it's something that you have to, to consider. If you are relying on the same data set um, as another entity, uh, you have to find a way to calculate that risk into your, uh, into your trading uh, portfolio to figure out how how are, how are you going to handle situations like this, like the uh, you know the GameStop trading situation? Game, the GameStop uh, trading issue could be triggered by AI in a few years. I think that's what uh, Chair Gensler is getting at. And, and Bridget, if I can just <clears throat> follow up, um, you'd, you'd been asking about expertise on boards. Mm -hmm. Since I have the benefit of a room full of uh, defense attorneys and consultants um, and, and others, you know, I, I think that um, all of us would be remiss, regulators and defense bar, uh, to not be trying to get that expertise ourselves, um, because uh, you know, you, you, the whole panel is, you know, what what regulators are going to care about and how defense attorneys can be um, advising their clients. And so I think, you know, just some things to expect if uh, something does go wrong, the SEC does have an investigation, we're going to be asking a lot of questions, asking to, to get a lot of facts that, you know, could feel very granular and could feel very um, data-driven. Uh, would want to understand the inputs into the AI. Would want to understand, is it off the shelf or is it something that has been developed in-house? Um, what has been going on in terms of monitoring it? People talked about that on the, on the, on the panel already. Um, what's the monitoring cadence? Uh, what are the policies and procedures? Um, would want to know what forensic artifacts um, exist in terms of logs or other things um, so that we can really understand what happened. Um, again, a lot of that is not going to be um, necessarily assuming that something went wrong. Um, I know not everybody may agree with this, but our um, investigations do start as fact-driven inquiries to try to understand what happened. But in a space that is technology driven, that can feel like a lot to try to get your arms around. Um, and so I think having a defense counsel um, who are up to speed on those issues um, and understanding how to get into a company and ask for those things and understand it themselves so they can help us understand is going to be really important in this yeah. space. And you know, I, I think that's such great advice because you know, for myself, when I think about AI and, and you know potential questions from clients, it's it's such a it's just such a big question. But to step back and just think about it in terms of what is expected now, and and kind of frame it in terms of all right, well, let's just baseline. This is what's required, and kind of take it from there is is a great way great way yeah. to look at it. Yeah, and it's not even just necessarily what's required, but just you know knowing if something happens going into a company, those kind of questions to know to ask um, of what do you have? You know, what are people going to be able to look at 
Um, so you can be telling people what to preserve or what to expect questions around in terms of what's there, how do we kind of reverse engineer what happened um, and be able to explain it, um, I think will be really important. Um, and in terms of a, a company that is using AI to perform some of the tasks that um, are required um, from a regulatory perspective and the logs and things like that, to the extent that the SEC comes knocking at, is it safe to say that you'd expect to see those things exist? I mean, yes and no. I say yes and no because, um, you know, we talked about this a little bit at the, at the, at the start. AI is such a big term and it's not monolithic. Um, and that, that's kind of the point of it that, um, AI is there to help answer different questions and it, it, you know, by its nature, supposed to be very particularized and potentially different um, for each company. And so, um, subject to there not being any specific rules mandating what needs to be kept, um, that's going to be one of the first questions: is what is there? And and I think that you know, much like when it comes to uh, the trading algorithms we've already seen and other things, companies may have their own business reasons, separate and apart from. Uh, regulators to be preserving some of these things, to understand and be able to be monitoring it for their own business reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and so there may be those things there um, for very good reasons that can also help um, if there is something that goes wrong um, that can help both the company understand it but also help regulators. Because to Jeremiah's point, just because something happens does not per se mean that there is necessarily a violation. Mm -hmm. um, and so helping us understand what happened as soon as possible um, will you know, be in everybody's best interest. You know, it's sort of to Carolyn's point earlier, um, I was thinking that there's actually an incredible service. Um, OK, this may sound strange coming from a defense attorney, but it's incredible service um, done by the SEC in, in posing the questions in a sweep. Because if, if people, if the companies are thinking about it, they say, they'll say, oh, committees? Should we have committees? What do we do that we should have committees that talk about this, you know, that, that think about this? Um, and really, but then the thing is to assess based on your business, based on what you do, based on whether or not it makes sense given, you know, your business model and what, where you use these tools and et cetera, you know, when it makes sense, when it doesn't make sense. It's early enough days that, and, and you know, this proposed rule, for example, hasn't happened yet, um, that, you know, there is time to think, think through really carefully where do we need to have, what kind of policies and procedures do we need to have, have in place? How are we using these tools? Um, where do we need to have more people thrown at the problem? Where do we need consultants thrown at the problem? Um, and so how, how do we really manage this to sort of stay on top of the issue before, well, in some ways before it gets away from us? Because the, to the concern about you know, technology, technology moves fast. Mm -hmm. um, ChatGPT managed to run through different models fairly quickly. And you know, looking at like a 3.0 versus a 4.0, I can't remember, um, is a very different thing in the types of you know, results that you, that you generate. We're not talking about generative AI necessarily, but you know, we may be. Yeah, uh. yeah. And it's, you know, it's interesting for the, the rules that are being proposed or will be proposed in the future to be able to you know, appreciate that this is an area that will change, like I I'd said before, like it could change tomorrow, right? And to be able to account for you know, the fact that they will change but still have a framework that makes sense and is helpful, mm -hmm. I think is gonna, is gonna be um, certainly a challenge. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that, that goes. Yeah, and I, I mean, I would expect that the defense bar is going to continue to use AI um, and will be increasing the use of AI when it comes to things like document reviews, document productions. Um, that's gonna be something we're interested in as well, is understanding that, you know, from the regulator's perspective, and probably you'll get asked more and more questions about it. How are you using it? Um, why are you comfortable that this has worked and we've gotten everything um, you know, that, that we need? Um, and what were the inputs? That, those sorts of things. So um, I expect that that will be a, an additional um, uh, you know, side to AI going forward. We can either give you a minute and 25 seconds left or take a question. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> great. Thanks so much. <laughs>